medieval depiction of fireworks festival. It wouldn't look like anything special if there weren't a couple of uh, curious activities going on at this festival. For example, this installation, which seems to produce some sort of light, but it's not uh, linear as it is with the properly depicted fireworks or the also very well depicted torches or smoke from gunfire, all of which are depicted with light spreading in a linear manner. The strange devices emit light in the same way as a Tesla coil does. Also, it would be very hard to explain what the chaps around are doing if we continue to believe that the known sources of light known to man at that time would be candles, simple torches, fireworks, things like that. What these two are doing doesn't seem to be much different from this modern Tesla coil entertainment. And indeed, the medieval illustrator did a very good job with the details. Do you notice that the swords are not straight? They are flame swords. In the various lands of Europe, similar names would be given. Flambert, Flammert, Flammenschwert, Flamberge. All of the names obviously pointing towards their main quality. They would make flame. And not just any flame, not like the flame of the fireworks or like the normal light which goes in straight rays, but exactly Tesla coil style flame. They are manufactured till date, again for entertainment. They bear the same name and they look the same and probably even te the technology behind them is probably similar as well. Here the zigzag is not on the outside but is still visible in the technical sketch showing the principle on which they work. So this thing was found a couple of years ago in Kosovo, the Balkans area of Eastern Europe. So apparently even our top pride, our modern electronics, even they seem to be nothing new. Nothing really, really only modern that is. If we believe the modern geology that all this stone was formed millions of years ago, which is probably not true. Here is one of the proofs. There are countless others as well. But the thing is that the thing has got a wheeled plug. It's not a really modern thing in stone, like the coin, and it's not even an exception. There are many of these type. And although in this case they are very small and precise size is the only surprise, here in Siberia they were even made with nanotechnology. And again, a lot or maybe even everything of what I've shown you so far does not belong to some lost, wiped out civilization. It turns out we knew a lot about electricity even a few hundred years ago. And not just a lot, in some respects even more 
than a common person on the street would know nowadays. And the modern man is somewhat like this creature which has zero interest into inquiring into the science which stands behind the building of his home or at least the metal part of his home. It has decided to limit its existence as far as the straw goes. In the same way the modern man will sometimes walk into a church and this will hang above his head, but it will never strike him that it not only looks like some sort of a scientific model, but it also could have been used as a technical device with some very practical application. Now let's see what's the situation with some modern patterns for using atmospheric electricity. Doesn't it look familiar, all these domes on top of one another? And in the description of the patent they say that they have come up with this setup and these shapes just because they are optimal for collecting the biggest amount of electricity. The domes are described in detail in the patent. They must be hollow and interconnected in that way with each other exactly like it is in the churches. And then look at the antenna of this modern church. It's exactly as the older crosses in Christianity before they introduced the well-known Christian cross. This is how it looked like. And if you are not satisfied because the crescent is missing in the old cross, here I would offer to you a really good-looking crescent, exactly as they should be. So we continue with this fully functional setup of the patent. We have a hanging metal element, which is of course present in the old temples as well churches, and not only churches. So, what else do we need to have our setup complete? Metal floor. And here are some old churches where the metal floor is still preserved. And before getting into what were they powering with this electricity, let's uh, see the things from broader perspective and not get limited to one single patent. Actually, getting atmospheric electricity is relatively easy. This man is even taking a metal element high up in the air with his drone. Why? Because that's how it works. You need this metal element to have it high up there to have access to more electricity. And that's why we have all these antennas on the old buildings. Often there would be a cross as well on it, but not always. And even when we see real Christian cross on the top of such domes, this doesn't mean that the original entities which put in place the rules for building ancient temples, they had exactly uh, this symbol of the suffering Jesus being crucified in mind when they were making the rules of what in the church should be built how and what is the practical application of what we now perceive as mere symbols. So let's see again the sketch of one of the patents for a modern atmospheric electricity power station. So everything we see here are already very familiar elements from the antique or so-called new classical architectural styles.
These are contemporary historic illustrations and also some installations have survived till date. Even as close as year 1889, we see very curious machineries at the technical exhibition in Paris, which was the most famous showcase for all the cutting-edge technologies at that time. And all these mini church domes would be displayed in the technical department. The situation at other similar exhibitions of the same time period is the same. Were these functional installations for collecting and using atmospheric electricity, or were they just cargo cult, imitating without understanding? This, for example, looks like some sort of cargo cult to me, still carrying the antenna. What once has been a functional antenna is probably now just a kind of a religious symbol. The first and most important thing that we have to do if we want to start understanding the ancient advanced technologies is to first of all abandon the deeply rooted concept that we need a very sophisticated device to get high-tech results. And that's why, in 1985, Shivkar Babuji Talpait built and flew an aircraft made of bamboo filled with liquid mercury, favorite ingredient of the alchemists. And yet the Shippelpedia tells us that it was the Wright brothers, eight years later, who successfully flew the first heavier-than-air powered aircraft. The achievements of Shivkar Babuji Talpait are not publicly denied, they are just presented in a very misleading light. Oh, he flew it for some time and then the thing fell down. The airplane of uh, Shivkar Babuji Talpait was something like this. This was made actually for the Bollywood movie about him. So they're distracting our attention with the fact that it didn't fly long. So what, the Wright brothers? They went all the way to Saturn and came back with their aircraft? What the Wright brothers got right, and that's why they entered in the famous history, is that they used the technology which is in line of what would be allowed for pe common people to know and use during this era. What Talpaid was making was based on the Vimanas, in modern words, UFO, UFOs, of the gods of the Vedic books, the principles behind which would be to elegantly and without pollution, take the freely available all-around energies. Well, what modern man is allowed to do is to only have access of polluting and centrally controlled sources of energy for the purpose of total enslavement by the use of artificial intelligence in the form of computer networks, which of course are 
centrally regulated again, which networks fully control what kind of uh, information the people have access to, along with the most practical aspects of life. For example, where can you go? Do you have access to certain countries or areas is determined by an electronic device which reads a card or other form of identification which you have to present. The various branches of this centrally operated and regulated network also determine if you have the power to buy anything, if your credit or debit cards will function. When they really want to restrict somebody, they disable all that and he cannot buy anything. He cannot rent a car to go anywhere or fuel his own or call anybody on the phone. The simple bamboo and mercury manned aircraft of uh, Shifkar Babuji Telpaid would have been an option to become independent of this centrally managed by arti artificial intelligence system and that's why most people have never heard about it and that's why this branch of technology is not allowed in the civil sector its application is only allowed in the non-civil sector we look for new energy but energy is around us everywhere all the time but most time we waste them until recently we find this can be a very important effect materials and the beam material when they become physically contact there's a charge transfer if they are separate by a gap there's a voltage generated and this occurs for almost any materials we know today. We are in the School of Material Science Engineering, Georgia Tech. We have invented a, a new energy technology. I believe they are going to change the world we live in the near future. When we first invented this, the output was just 3 volts. Today, our best can be 10,000 volts. Mechanical energy is everywhere. Independent of weather, independent of day or night, independent of season. So anything you can think of, and we even think for, for big ocean wave, 31 terawatt energy can be harvested. That's twice of today's world energy consumption. Uh, it will not take too long. Five years. Five years? Even 50 will not be enough unless humanity collectively decides to leave this parasitic paradigm in which the freely available mechanic energy is not allowed for personal use. So what are these Vimanas that I mentioned from the Vedic books? These are exactly what now we call UFOs. The only difference is that in Vedic times people were in contact with those who flew such aircrafts, while the modern man prefers to live in ignorance and says it is a mystery and closes his eyes while browsing the photographs from the Second World War. The only ones which are still publicly available showing people who were making manufacturing UFOs. If you're not familiar with this subject, I would recommend getting familiarized as soon as possible because with the speed with which they remove all unwanted information from outlets like YouTube, soon maybe even those images may not be available. So where did they get the technical specifications for manufacturing UFOs during the Second World War? Again, from Vedic sources, this is uh, one of the people who were employed in translating for them and making the Vedic concepts understandable because Sanskrit is very difficult to translate. And interestingly enough, surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly, if you search for the word Vimana in his official quite long biography on Shippelpedia, the search results are zero. 
all these intricate endless carvings of the Vedic temples, actually they contain many vimanas, but for a foreigner they might be somewhat hard to identify because they somewhat resemble small houses or some sort of uh, decorative pavilions. Here we've got a couple of uh, UFOs parked just like that in a broad daylight. Many of the pyramidal or dome-shaped towers or domes of the Vedic temples are actually entire huge vimanas. It's not just my personal interpretation, this is what people were carving, depicting the god. It moves around with its uh, UFO, its aircraft, and that's why it is the thing that you would uh, expect to be carved in a temple, the abode of the Lord. Here a Vimana in the blue skies, it's flying, it looks like a castle. So many books are included in the Vedic literature as such. And of course there are so many mentions of Vimanas, but one of them stands out and that's Vimanika Shastra. Although it has been dictated in trance some merely hundred years ago, those who wrote it down claim that the ancient rishis were simply dictating through them a very old text. Well, as people say, seeing is believing. The photographs of functional UFOs that we have from the Second World War, well, they're exactly like Rukmi Vimana. One of the models described in Vimanika Shastra. And by the way, something of a very similar shape crashed, made a crash landing in Pennsylvania, Kecksburg, on December 9, 1965. In the absolutely magnificent temple Shiranga Mandir in India, not only they have a pure gold vimana, that's why the yellow is so bright, we are used to that mixed and pure gold, but in India people still use pure 24 karat gold and have made an entire vimana representation from it, but apparently according to reports of local people while they were digging in the area they found an old genuine old and still functioning vimana some 10 feet tall in the underground chambers of the temple the chamber is currently of course sealed And for those who prefer a type of electricity which is uh, nearer to our modern way of uh, making it, that's also there in the Vedic scriptures, in Agastya Samhita, that's a very old compilation. A very practical and uh, simple setup is described with enough details so that everybody can build and many thousands in India have tested it and it worked. It's as simple as the famous Baghdad batteries as of which I'm sure everybody has heard. And in addition, the sage Agastya talks about a chain of hundreds of them. So these people, they knew what they were doing. Some of the old high-tech installations still function. It is not by chance that in the Tirumala Vinkateshvara temple in India, in Tirupati, they strictly monitor and don't allow any type of luggage inside 
so that nobody gets a chance to bring in any electronic device. Of course, cell phones and cameras are absolutely prohibited as well. And not just in the temple itself, the entire area seemed to affect electronic devices and common people are not given a chance to study what is this all about. Like, for example, at this stargate through which an incarnation of the Supreme Lord once entered our world, one is not allowed at all with or without luggage, it is just locked up because when the era of the electronic gadgets started, people started noticing that they behave erratically at the place. For example, a person with a pacemaker just passed out when this was still opened and he visited the spot. And as usual, the attention of the common people is distracted in this way. It's typical, this is how Wikipedia describes the Stargate. Ironically enough, Wikipedia tells the actual truth, but most people will not understand it. And they did not intend it to be the truth when they wrote it. The thing is that anyway, everything that is natural, including nature and earth, is actually supernatural. Another excellent example of still functional old technology would be probably the Somavati temple in Sri Lanka. It's a place with a record high number of UFO sightings, very well documented. Most probably it is uh, because the installation on the top of the temple, which includes a large crystal, is properly maintained according to the old rituals. pneumatic trains. It sounds so futuristic, so high-tech. But people were using them century and a half ago in New York. It was fully functional, in op it operated for some time, and people traveled in style. But because it used that clean energy, which is all around us, they just closed it down. We are not allowed to use this energy. We are too stupid for that. Even in modern days, now it is not banned, but practically it cannot serve the masses, this pneumatic technology. The excuse is always the lack of funds. But what about all the enormous subsidies poured into the oil industry, if they are directed towards cleaner technologies, there will be no lack of funds. So they closed down the luxurious pneumatic uh, underground in New York and later on built the underground tube the way we know it now. Look in what kind of carriages they put the people initially. This is such a downgrade from before. In London, it wasn't that luxurious as New York because they managed to stop the project at an even earlier stage, but it was there as well. Depriving us of pneumatic trains was not the worst by far. The dirigibles, that type of transport, is not only many times cheaper than an airplane, it has many other advantages, like smooth flight, it can offer very easily spacious cabins for scenic travel, also it is much safer than airplane travel, as confirmed by the modern tests as well. But since the parasitic forces want us to work like insane and use only centrally controlled polluting 
technologies, what they did was they filled one of the biggest dirigibles in the time when they were still in use. They filled it with flammable gas instead of uh, helium, which they knew is the gas which should be put in the airship. And this is the result. They did not have to wait long for the tragedy to happen. People died and after that the effective smear campaign started about how unsafe the dirigibles are. And by killing people, by emotionally traumatizing the masses, of course they stopped the dirigibles, the airships. Of course, there are still some dirigibles, even modern models. They are very good, they maneuver very well, they are very safe, economical, but since they are not accessible for the masses, the situation is under parasitic control, so they are okay with it. And how can they make such fools of us? It's very easy. When people watch TV, they enter a hypnotic state. Then the minds of the hypnotized masses are tuned with false suggestions according to the current agenda of the parasitic government which is in charge of the given sheeple. Let's take the electric cars as an example. Just see computer graphics, the green color, and then they show you the electric plug. And then many people think that electric cars are really eco-friendly. Well, what they do only is export pollution from the cities to the regions where the electric power stations. And even though they are not good by themselves, the electric cars are also slightly suppressed technology. The manufacturers still have some difficulties and the petrol companies still receive those huge subsidies. So why the parasites are somewhat against electric cars as well? They are centrally controlled, they are polluting. Well, the thing is that it gets very close to the attention of many people, well, why don't I hook up a solar panel and put it on the roof of the car? No, you are not allowed in many countries already. The laws are in place to forbid you to do that because you become independent, that is, against the parasitic plan. And many people raise these questions in forums and other places. And then we read these answers, you see? To add a solar panel would cost an extra 5,000 and the power generated from it would be so little that you will drive only 5 meters from it. So it's not uh, really uh, cost justified, that's why they don't manufacture them like that. And people buy this nonsense. Yes, some people believe this and even repeat it. While so many people drive their DIY cars and even cargo trucks on solar power only. Airplanes can go around the world on solar power only. And yet people believe these lies from the mass media that your car can go only 5 meters with solar power only. People with master's degrees in engineering believe that and I have asked them why do you think so? And they always say I heard it on TV. And I try to talk to them, but you know that they always lie on TV, why do you believe them about this? The answer is, yeah, they lie about politics, but this is not about TV, this is science, this is proven thing. Not to even mention how many people have demonstrated again and again functioning models of cars powered by water. Usually such inventors disappear or get murdered rather fast. And all types of vehicles like this one, hybrid, magnetic or only magnetic, very rarely we would barely manage to hear about them before they disappear together with the company which manufactures them. The commercial models of very cheap solar cars are ready since decades. 
But no, there will be no mercy for us, at least in near future. As long as we collectively remain in this parasitic paradigm, the plan is to make us suffer more and more and thus lower our consciousness to animal level. That's why we have this artificially engineered financial crisis and many other things, like for example the lab-made terrible diseases which they try to spread all the time. Actually, electric cars are not getting popular or introduced nowadays. They're something very old. Do you see the charging cable here? This one is from Detroit. And Paris, New York, most of the taxis were electrical. That's in the beginning of the 20th century. But one particular point I found like mind-blowing from this uh, old catalog for electric cars, Babcock Electrics. So here you can make yourself familiar with the company and then various models along with their prices. 2200 3,200, 4,000 and the surprise is towards the end of this catalogue I can barely believe it but I'm showing you what it actually says 1,244 mile tour on a single battery Th that's 2,000 kilometers, it's even shown on the map there is no like confusion with the decimal figures or something. I mean, the modern electric cars have a range of uh, 100 to 200 kilometers per charge. Is this some sort of different type of mile? Or am I confused about something? Bright future, it says. For whom? I'm sure the parasites are laughing at us rolling from laughter, falling from the chair when they see how easily we buy such shallow lies. <laughs> Years ago I was in England and they banned with law many branches of uh, natural medicine on the grounds that one lady felt side effects, mild side effects from a kidney medicine and that was it. She was fine in a few days, there were no consequences but on these grounds they made this legislation and the people bought it. Entire branches of the natural medicine were banned because of uh, that lady who felt slight side effects. And many people actually supported this ban because of dangerous stuff, you know? When we are so stupid, which god will have mercy on us? There is no shortage of modern inventions which would eliminate poverty in no time and would make prosperous life for everybody easily achievable. The only problem is that we, the people, choose the wrong leaders. We sabotage our own lives, guided through hypnotic suggestions received from the TV. The fuel on which the entire tragedy runs is the excessive alcohol consumption, which was also introduced and is still now maintained by the parasitic forces. Here the trams are also very interesting. They don't have these uh, things on the top like the usual trams. Uh, at least I have seen in my childhood they get uh, fed with electricity from the top while these seem to get them from their rails or are they on batteries or atmospheric electricity? God knows. Some men add fins to their cars without 
having uh, any special calculations from qualified engineers and so on, and managed to save up to 25% fuel after installing such fins. So where are these international organizations and commissions who scream so loudly that they make everything to protect the environment, everything possible? They seem to be just another department of this preposterous scam, farce, which is just uh, meant to keep us anchored within this paradigm, because the parasites don't have the right to keep us by force. The only way is to make us believe ourselves and maintain this paradigm. Here, this man made a solar car himself. He cannot drive it at places. It's just against the law. So he pulled it manually through the banned areas with the hope to awaken the people. I don't know how successful was that, because the people in general continue to vote for those very same politicians who work against the interest of those who elect them. And there are other type of politicians as well. Simply the people are too short-sighted to recognize them and to care to vote for them. When they were fabricating the official history, it was difficult to always remove all details and here and there something from the truth was left, and one of them is the history of rockets in medieval times. They appear in the historic records that are available for us all of a sudden in the 17th century without any prior evolution at all in a ready-made form, and moreover in a historic time when the need of um, developing them was not yet there. The rockets of Alexander Zasyadko that were made a few centuries ago would fly six kilometers away and he was not the only one in England at the same time they would fly almost uh, for almost three kilometers. But what I find most astonishing is their modern looks and all of this appeared supposedly without any prior evolution or at least we don't know how they appeared to be more precise. This image reflects more or less the standard picture that uh, we are presented of the English invasion in India. But those who like to read history books will find the following description of the battle that occurred when they attacked the kingdom of Hyder Ali in Muso. He had a special division of rocket shooters that numbered some 1,200 men and they poured on the British rockets that were six kilos in weight and would fly for one kilometer. In 1650, Kazimir Semyonovich issues a very interesting book called Artis Magnae Artilleria Pars Prima. So quite a few centuries ago we have ready-made modern rockets, exactly the same proportions, the same shape. And the most surprising for the modern or even shocking for the modern uh, rocket engineers are for example the nozzles. They look exactly like the modern nozzles, the same shape, the same proportion, the same size according to the body of the rocket, but nowadays these nozzles they are calculated by high-level international teams of scientists who have uh, very complex formulas recently discovered. And yet we see the very same nozzles centuries ago. So again, the story doesn't uh, match very well. We are told that the laws of physics on which the calculations of the nozzles of the modern rockets are based were discovered just a couple of decades ago then how did they know what kind of nozzles to put centuries ago? 
not to mention even that Kazmier Semyonovich says that uh, these are not rockets invented in his time. This is older stuff that he is just writing about. People knew about these nozzles and designs and aerodynamic shape even long before he compiled his book. This is a medieval image. He is holding a modern rocket. The famous Dendera light bulbs. And also all these types of uh, buildings were always told they were places of worship based on their looks and the inscriptions found in them. But as far as the looks, they are not that different from those of some neoclassical electric substations. Or maybe the colorful decorations, you get that as well. Actually, most likely they were both temples and at the same time, some sort of uh, power stations or substations. It's hard to say what kind of power exactly were they transmitting, but if it was electrical, probably it was not wired. The upper parts of this magnificent temple in India, the Ramapa temple, are made of uh, autoclaved aerated concrete, which according to the Penguinian history was invented in the 20th century. And yet this is a historic temple, officially dating to the 11th century. The stone of which the upper part is made doesn't only look like uh, aerated concrete. It definitely has all the proper properties of the aerated concrete. For example, it floats in water. So using aerated concrete instead of standard one gives various advantages, one of which is that it makes the buildings more earthquake resistant. Yeah, it's lighter, so less likely to collapse. But not all ancient and historic temples in India are built out of such concrete. The use of this material is not very common. Why did they decide to use it exactly at this location and only in the upper part of the mandir? Most likely uh, they even saw in the future and knew what is about to happen to this temple. Just see how it looks inside. And all that is a result of a very violent earthquake as if they knew what is about to come. The historic accounts of ever-burning lights, lights which don't get distinguished by wind or rain, are quite few. It is simply too many of them and 
their descriptions are quite clear. The people knew what they were writing about to accept the mainstream explanation that people in those days were of course stupid and they didn't know what are they talking about. Also, there are countless uh, historic underground tunnels and cities and rocket ruins and so on. And also about them there are quite few accounts that they had some sort of uh, lightning which we, we don't understand very well. There seem to be even modern accounts of uh, people who have uh, still seen that type of light functioning. Of course, the underground uh, ruins and worlds are quite easy to hide from the public and that's why we're not gonna find what is going on there anytime soon. At least as long as we continue with this way of life. It's not so much that some evil aliens or evil groups of people are restricting us in such a way. It is mostly our own ignorance. For example, let's return to those uh, magical swords, the medieval magic weapons, literally, because a lot of what they did was also due to the spells which they would usually put in them. So how did the spells work exactly will be probably a subject of another series of videos maybe even longer than the entire survivors, but let's take even a basic thing. Before the warriors would go to fight, before a battle, they would always recharge their weapons by sticking them in the ground. And that wasn't some sort of a superstitious ritual, but something very practical. Those who are aware of the benefits of what we now call earthing will immediately understand that the technology that these fighters were using for charging their weapon is not much different than the technology we use now to recharge our mobile phones. But this was a common knowledge back then. Even common people knew how to connect to Earth and channel power directly, while what percentage of the modern population actually uses earthing or understands well how it works? I guess less than one. So in the beginning of the video, we saw architectural elements in the design of the old churches and other old structures, which suggested that they might have had something to do with atmospheric electricity. So what was this electricity used for? In the old temples, including mosques and churches, there were kind of uh, glass vessels hanging on metal elements attached to the ceiling. In Russia they were called Molochne Share, which means milk balls. I don't know what was the western name, but uh, they were mentioned very often in the old Russian literature. Even some photos have survived of the last functional milk balls. This is when they're lit up. But they are not uh, oil lamps or some sort of candles, it's the liquid itself which glows. It may or may not be connected with the atmospheric electricity collected by the dome. And then here you can see them empty. As you can see they, they are good sized vessels. Although to us it may seem that they were kind of uh, lightning solution for the temples. This wasn't their main function, it seems, for the people who were using them at that time. According to contemporary sources, they were used for holy 
fire. Now, I personally don't really understand. Was the holy fire from Jerusalem kept in such vessels? Was the liquid of the milk bowls activated by that holy fire? That special miracle fire with which people wash their beards and hands and faces and it doesn't burn them in the first few minutes after it appears in a miraculous way in Jerusalem. So are these vessels being lit up from that fire or was this uh, like a name used for any holy like sacred fire? Because the substances which were put in these vessels were also magical substances. They were sold in, um, as far as I understand, dedicated shops for such things and um, there were quite few of them. But subsequently with the church reforms and as the church was uh, getting more and more divorced from its original mission to expand people's consciousness, they also uh, gradually removed or maybe even banned these uh, holy fire vessels. The original function of which, besides lightning, was uh, apparently also to awaken like telepathic abilities, increase intuition, and in general widen the spectrum of perceivable reality around us. So as the churches and the temples were turning more and more into a tool of narrowing our consciousness, of course uh, such uh, simple devices were being replaced or maybe they made it gradually, maybe they were just um, diluting the substances which were put in the jars, adding colorants, all kinds of poisons and stuff, and they wouldn't work anymore. Electricity was used a lot in the past. Those who have invested interest in hiding the true history from us can very easily hide its usage simply because it didn't always involve this excessive wiring as it does nowadays. So the artifacts are not there, at least the artifacts that we would expect to find. For example, this is a very interesting video to chaps. One of them runs through the other one million volts. Don't try this at home, they know what they are doing. They did it safely, that's why they survived it. But the boy through whom they run the electric charge he was doing all that stuff which we would describe as biblical miracles, like thunderbolts coming out of his fingers when he points at something, moving objects, light objects, with his uh, uh, remotely with his hands. In other words, the usage of electricity in deep antiquity remains mysterious for us, First of all, because the hardware involved was probably quite different and mainly because its applications were quite different. People were using it for different things, they had different interests in life. They were more aware of the multidimensional nature of their own selves. The spectrum of the reality was much wider for them and that's why when the limited uh, modern man tries to comprehend or understand what was going on, he will usually hit a wall. We will be unable to understand the practical aspects of their daily lives only after we learn how to see the universe through their eyes, through their mentality. <laughs> And by the way, in that video, his hair moves. It's very funny. It's not like the hair of the Medusa women from the International Space Station, which they spray with hair fix 
and that's why it stays fixed in the same position through the entire pathetic hoax show. So in the beginning of the video we saw architectural elements on the top of the buildings which resembled modern installations for collecting atmospheric electricity. But resembling and having functional installations are completely different things. So some of these buildings are pretty recent, were the people as close as a couple of hundred years ago using atmospheric electricity in their homes? Or were they just imitating ancient things without understanding their essence? And if it was just an imitation, then were the ancient prototypes functional then? Talking about historic atmospheric electricity, most people have heard about Nikola Tesla, but not much more. But in this 19th century book, we find information that actually these attempts to use atmospheric electricity were more or less always there. Chapter 10 of Basics of Meteorology and Climatology. The chapter gives an overview of the attempts to make use of the atmospheric electricity during the 18th and 19th centuries. Various setups were tested, including uh, metal rods put at high places and even kites and balloons. I really like this illustration from this book. Every house has got its own balloon feeding it with electricity. But most of all, I like this illustration. It is exactly in the chapter dealing with atmospheric electricity. And it illustrates in particular at what height it can be harvested most conveniently. Here they specifically explain how high churches can reach different layers of the atmosphere and how much atmospheric electricity can be collected at those levels. How many of the modern people are aware about this stuff? Not necessarily in relation to churches, what about the building in which they live in? And not only about the atmospheric electricity potential of that building, what about the electric wiring in the building itself that affects directly the health of the residents inside the building? Recently I published a video based on this book dating to the very same period. Although I published it as a fiction video, many elements from the description of the journeys of the soul from one body to another seem to be not that much fictional after all, because in the last few decades we have this new, at least for us, new scientific tool of the past life regressions, which is nothing else but an old revived shamanic tool with which we can uh, recover verifiable information of what happens to the souls after and before they inhabit their current body. And a lot of the details that are new for us, because they come from this very recent source, they are already in this uh, trilogy, which contains the description of the other planets or, if you prefer, planes of existence. And even without going into details from this book, the very fact that uh, it is all about the reincarnational path of the souls, and it is written by Christians for Christians, according to some sources, it was even used as a textbook in a royal army for Christian officers in a Christian government. This by itself makes me wonder what was the Christianity like 200 years ago. It is not a secret that the early Christians had this doctrine of the reincarnation, it was part of their belief. And as the original teachings were uh, gradually distorted and corrupted, reincarnation was given less and less attention 
And at the end, it got completely rejected. Certain divisions, subdivisions of uh, Christianity remain true to these teachings of the reincarnation up to uh, the 18th century. That was uh, the information I had before. But now with this 19th century book, we don't find just mere hints. The very process of the reincarnation is the basis of everything that is happening. I'm giving this example with the reincarnation just to show once again that even a couple of hundred years ago people knew much more than we think about many areas of life. Here are some robots even. So this book reviews the attempts to use atmospheric electricity in the period of the 17th through 19th centuries. And as far as the usage of electricity in the times before that, before the 17th century, not only we lack information because we can't just go and open in the library books from really old times. We don't have access to them, mostly they are hidden. But even if we had access and we could read them, we may not even understand them fully. Because the most common situation was that we had tribes with relatively simple lives, which were given very high knowledge about the electromagnetic nature of things of reality by higher sources by the gods and providing lightning facilities in the houses of tri the tribal people was not usually the priority of the gods with the help of advanced electromagnetic techniques people would acquire mystic powers they would get access to other aspects of their self or they would get healed or rejuvenated in a manner that would look miraculous to us, the modern people. And also, they were taught how to use this uh, higher level knowledge of electromagnetism to maintain regular connections with the deities. Basically, the temples are places for very intensive exchange of electromagnetic energies. Sometimes they recharge people, they charge them with energy, sometimes they harvest their energy. And the earlier example of um, the holy place in India, which affects modern cell phones and pacemakers, is a very revealing one. It shows that something powerful is going on on electromagnetic level at that spot and yet we don't see anything resembling the modern electrical gadgets. Now do you see the figures of the three monks? Judging in relation to their height, the door behind them would be some four meters high, let's say. That's a quite good size for a door. At least for us, but not for those who built the original door which was closed at some point to make the 4 meter door. The original one must be at least 8-9 meters. That's the height of a 3-4 storied building, just the door itself. Interesting, I wonder if it was made so big reflecting the actual size of the people who were walking in through this door, the original one, or was it just the level of 
their self-awareness expressed as an architectural element. Maybe some 1,000 years ago, the destiny of humanity took a turn. Now, the sons of magicians, the sons and daughters of magicians, were exploring the dark side. That's why their our consciousness had to be lowered. Our magical knowledge was taken away. And as we voluntarily accepted the symbols of the dark side, it is now rewarding us by giving us back some of the old technologies which, again, allow us to modify our reality, like in the old times, in a magical way. It's very similar, only the terms and conditions of use are different. One can even acquire in the shop reasonably priced, mind-controlled gadgets. Exactly like the magicians of the old times. You just think and it happens. But there are few conditions, few new conditions. First of all, you depend on the central control, Big Brother, for having the technology. You can't manufacture the gadget yourself. And even when you acquire it, you can use it only as long as you are connected to the central artificial intelligence, which controls everything on Earth. You will have to report to this central artificial intelligence. It can uh, be, for example, in the form of a required internet connection or by registration. Yeah, you have to submit your credit card details. You will be asked continuously to create online accounts to verify that it is yourself. That's because the artificial intelligence monitors you all the time and in addition these uh, gadgets which read your brain waves they not only read them they can also influence them which is also nothing new under the sun because influencing the thoughts of others without their direct awareness and with malevolent content that it's called simply black magic that is sorcery and they always make it look like as if this is some sort of new invention that has never been seen before while they're just reviving the old techniques. Selling us back what they stole from us centuries ago. The price that we have to pay is the most valuable thing for them, our psychic energy. It has nothing to do with money, it is only the small pawns on the bottom who are after money, those who execute the plan on the ground, those who pull the strings on the top, they print money, they can manufacture billions for themselves and they do it just with few computer clicks. They cannot be after money, they are after something else. And the global people gladly pay the price. For example, if you search for divine in the Google brainwashing machine, this is what comes up. This is how our psyche has been distorted beyond recognition about what is good and beautiful and desirable. And as we curse ourselves with our own thought forms, when we call for the angels, this is who will come and they will do whatever they consider angelic. Our use of electric devices is really excessive. We are somewhat on the wrong path. In the past, when people were wiser, a lot was carried out, a lot of these tasks. They had sound solutions for them. Modern tests on what used to be called magic spells show definite results in for example, delivering certain messages to plants, restructuring water, moving objects. It has been shown again and again, sound can have also profound healing effects. All this and many more is nothing else but the old magical spells being rediscovered.
So Nikola Tesla was not discovering something new as such, he was simply consciously or unconsciously bringing back the old knowledge. Of course, he was a mystic himself. Tesla style installation was recently set up in US, but of course it has nothing to do with attempting to benefit the lives of the people who have financed all this with their taxpayers' money. What to speak of uh, the benefits of this installation, they didn't even see the need to tell even the local people in the town what are they building. An important milestone in the process of making us dumb and uninformed was depriving us of the knowledge of the ether. In school we are being shown an incomplete periodic table of the chemical elements as made by Mendeleev. He himself studied and to some extent understood the ether and placed it first in his original table. This is his book Chemical Understanding of the World's Ether. But as he died, they edited his works and published them under his name and of course they changed the periodic table. And then when modern scientists observe various phenomena related to the ether, they are forced by the paradigm in which they are artificially placed to search other names for them. They put them in different categories even when they don't belong there or make up some fantasy categories like black holes, Antimatter, black matter, orange matter, green matter, mystery, unexplained, and so on and so forth. And no wonder that uh, historically we find mostly, when we dig, remains of uh, settlements which would be relatively simpler than our current towns and villages. And yet sometimes they would uh, have installations which are better than ours or artifacts which we cannot reproduce. And the reason for that is very simple and obvious from all historic sources. People did not discover gradually things as they always tell us in school. It was all given by divine sources. For example, the first emperor of China, who was extraterrestrial for all purposes. Or in the church there is even an expression, God, the geometer. And not only geometry, the angels were the givers of all knowledge of all sciences. And that's how it was. And the medical science is a perfect illustration for this. Not only we read in the old books about very complex procedures like open heart surgeries just with the herbal anesthetics, we also find the traces of that in uh, complex brain surgery surgeries, trepanation, if the people of those times were indeed as ignorant as the penguins assure us, they must have been dying from these holes that they were making in their heads. But they didn't, because uh, the modern autopsies, they actually see that in many cases uh, the people died from completely different reasons and the bone their skulls had healed successfully before that. Another example is the Vedic system of medicine called Ayurveda given to the people by the divine being Danvantari 
But not according to the penguins. They want us to believe that the people discovered all those very complex formulas for the Ayurvedic medicines themselves. I mean, look at the uh, contents of a given Ayurvedic medicine. Most likely you will see 20 or 30 ingredients which grow in areas far away from each other or maybe not always grow but get collected or found and their proportion is very complex and very precise this could not have been tested over time simply there couldn't have been that much population with the given sickness and if you don't get the percentages right in the combination it won't work it won't heal and there are hundreds of such Ayurvedic preparations. Even if we forget their number, even for a single one, how would you know which 30 ingredients you would collect from substances that come from very far away from each other regions? How would you know to start mixing, in case you're experimenting, exactly these substances in proportions uh, and you will have uh, practically so many thousands of possible combinations, indeed millions. If you don't know the uh, recipe already, you would have never guessed it. You would have never guessed even which 30 ingredients to select for the given sickness, let alone their complex proportion. There is also a documentary, the name of which escapes me at the moment, and it's about the same point that I just made about the Ayurveda but applied to the ancient Egyptian or Arabic in the uh, land of Egypt something like this medicine and it was proving in detail the very same thing those procedures could not have been discovered gradually by those type of people that the archaeologists show us in the museums maybe they could have been discovered by the type of people which they don't show us in the museums because they hide their mummies but as far as simple people using trial and error method no way to find all those medical secrets that they knew and sometimes modern men also stumble upon or rediscover by chance, maybe by chance, the ancient healing methods again. This remarkable man, Wim Hof, rediscovered what the ancient yogis have been doing for thousands of years. Using very simple breathing techniques, he made his body so resilient to external influences that he is able to kind of order it, order his body, to remain healthy even in very adverse conditions. The penguins subjected the poor Wim Hof to various tests, even to the point of injecting him with viruses. But he simply ordered his body to eliminate the viruses, and it did. The psychic surgeries, which are still sometimes carried out in the Philippines, in Africa, and mostly currently in South America, also seem to be a revived ancient method of healing. All this is done without anesthetic and after such major pulling and cutting, in a few minutes the patient is ready and simply goes home without any further complications. The first big study is made by Dr. Soitemann from Germany. She was studying uh, 1,200 patients for one year after they were cured in the Philippines. And they found a an, an, uh, percentage of 19% of positive uh, healing. 19 or 90? 90. 90. 90. If there are results, so there can be trickery. Important for me were the results. So I was collecting results from the whole world 
and uh, I didn't find 90%, but it was very nearby, and I was selecting uh, very uh, difficult patients with an infaust prognosis from the official uh, medical uh, staff. So it was normally um, uh, cancers with uh, metastasis. And so I found that it was uh, a really sur surprising uh, results of, uh, of this uh, type. The knowledge of metallurgy and smelting is a perfect example of very simple things, easy to carry out with simple means and achieve fantastic results, but only if you have somebody to tell you how to do it. Smelting, they are telling us, began 9000 years ago. But how come this is a chemical reaction? Oh, it was easy, the penguins say, you just throw colorful rocks, means ore, in the bonfire. And that is so ridiculous that even some of the penguins themselves don't believe it. And it is not just uh, putting colorful rocks in very hot fire over 1000 degrees Celsius. That is not your ordinary bonfire. You need to make special arrangements to reach such high temperatures. And you wouldn't do it unless you knew you, what you are doing. But one of the important things is that there is a very specific range. It's not just by achieving very hot temperature. You have to keep it within range. If you don't, your colorful rocks are not gonna turn into pure metal. They're gonna turn into waste. And at the same time, usually for smelting, you need catalysts for the reactions, even for the very simple recipes that they had in the very beginning. Yes, that can be obtained from simple materials, like uh, special types of bones ground and prepared in a special manner, but how would you know to put that in that cooking pot with the colorful rocks? So for simple men to discover smelting by chance is out of question. And yet the penguins want us to believe that not only they did it, but they did it independently. At many spots all over the globe. Well, the chances of that would be very difficult to calculate, but on the top of everything, the penguins assure us that not only it was independently discovered at different centers all over the globe, but it all happened simultaneously. So, the medical knowledge, the knowledge of smelting, are just small examples. All in all, all sciences and all knowledge were not discovered gradually by the primitive men. They were given by angels and the keepers of the time. Why the people in the past were so keen on wearing lots of gold on their heads, that's very heavy by the way, and if they could afford, they would even drink from golden cups, or if it wasn't pure gold, at least the rim would be covered with gold, if they can afford it. The answer which the penguins want you to believe, because they are paid to keep you in ignorance, is just because gold is shiny, looks good, it's expensive, and people want it to feel good looking and show off. But that is only a part of the full picture, and maybe even a small part, because what the people believed at that time is, for example, that the golden rim on a cup would remove the black magic in case it is in the liquid you pour in it. And surprisingly, or maybe I should say not surprisingly at all, in the modern days, 
we discover that shielding materials made of precious metals are most effective against harmful vibrations like for example the waves of the wireless internet or the radiations emitted by our cell phones which are very well known for making people sick. These modern vibrations are in no way different from the ancient vibrations called black magic or evil spells. Obviously the golden crowns of the rulers provided similar protection. The king wanted to be able to think for himself. He wore a golden crown as a shield to be sure that no third party is tempering with his thoughts and his decisions. For example, these are modern devices which facilitate hijacking of the decision-taking process of uh, the common people, of the masses. In the past, it could have been done with spells, without the help of devices or a combination of the two. It doesn't matter what exactly is the medium, the result is always a malevolent frequency, which could be neutralized partially or completely by mesh of precious metals. The rich and abundant embroidery of gold and silver on the garments of the clergy is in no way different from the modern silver fiber shield fabric. Their original purpose in older times would have been protection from malevolent wavelengths and also protection from the radiation from the various devices gifted by the gods and angels to the people of the earth. The holy men of the past who were really mediums between the angels and the humankind, they were the operators of uh, such devices and that's why they needed appropriate shielding clothing for the type of work they were doing. On what grounds should we consider those people more backwards than us, while the majority of modern men are not even aware that certain vibrations or even sounds which are outside of the spectrum which we normally hear, they can actually reprogram our psyche and brains and practically implant foreign thoughts in our consciousness. What to speak of doing anything against, against that? How many people are even aware this is going on? Even the so-called gold sometimes we occasionally wear is not really gold. Nine carat is more or less only one third gold. Star forts. Is this some sort of baroque lace for fussy lady or building justifying the needs of a military defense structure? In two previously published videos I showed that not everything that we see on the star forts can be justified with their alleged defense purpose. And also I have shown that their official history is of course not true. Sometimes they look kind of uh, proportionate, so to say, while in many other examples the lace is kind of too much. Too much lace to protect a relatively small enclosure 
Also, that enclosure wouldn't be enough to house all the soldiers, which would be expected, according to the mainstream version, to shoot at the enemy, aided by these special angles of the star forts. Let's take Tilbury Fort in London as an example. The English heritage is telling me that Tilbury Fort defended London from Tudor times, until the Second World War even. How could this tiny small thing defend London? Probably its greatest achievement would be to defend its empty square in the middle. So the official story is that all these angles here were made so that the soldiers of the fort itself would hide behind them and shoot at the enemies aided by these special angles of the star forts. The official story is that the angles will give an advantage of those who shoot from inside. Just look at these angles here. Do you think it will make any sense to send soldiers from inside all the way to those outposts? How would they even reach there if they use the bridge or boat? They will become an easy prey and get shot before they even reach their destination. And even if they reach alive, how can this corner or this one or this one provide any sort of protection to a soldier inside them. It is actually exactly the opposite. If an enemy has sieged this fort, if a soldier leaves, leaves the safety of the central core, even to reach those locations, he will be an easy prey. And even if he does reach, they will just corner him over there easily. He wouldn't be able to even run for his life in the fields. It's providing disadvantage rather than an advantage. Also, if the special angles of the walls were really providing an advantage when you shoot at the enemy, why did they make only half of a star fort here? Wouldn't they want also to shoot at their enemies, which would come with ships and boats as well? Or maybe their idea was to shoot at the boats from these small angles here, which are, by the way, so tiny and small that basically they provide no defense function at all. Also on this map of Spain we have normal star forts. Then we have star forts with what is maybe a cross, so that is still okay. But then some other crosses really look more like antennas. While others have even the Trishul of Shiva all the way in Granada, Spain. In Lisbon, they also decided it's fashionable, so they also have Trishul style antenna. According to somewhat reliable, let's say relatively reliable channel source, these star forts were actually using plasma technology. Or at least that was the case with the one which they viewed with astral vision. They said the actual installation was deep underground. While the people who were servicing the part on the top, they did not understand fully how it functions. They didn't have even electricity in the top part. God knows if that is true, but it certainly corresponds to the overall picture. Even nowadays, one may walk into a temple without being aware or inquiring into the matter that the dome above him or her, together with the entire architectural setup around, actually influence him, sometimes even profoundly. One may get healed in a temple, or one may have one's energy harvested, depending whom is the temple devoted to. Or another scenario that happens in modern times, one enters a temple and has one's energy harvested, taken away, 
which would result, let's say, in a sudden fatigue or depressive state or even sickness, while at the same time one is not even aware that one has entered the temple. How is that? Well, as we have covered many times in the videos already, the school curriculums are not based on actual science, but on the orders of those individuals and institutions which are above countries. They are so big, they rule the world. So they determine what the children will study in school and what not. So they take good care to convince most people that all this temple worship is just superstition and people are thinking nonsense and nothing actually happens besides the nonsense they think. While at the same time, the people on the very top who enforce these curriculums, they are very actively busy in shamanic stuff and they themselves are pretty busy with temple worship. This is a major part of their lives. And of course, they don't worship the benevolent protectors of mankind. And often, as part of their sick rituals, they build really vampire buildings which suck out the energy of those who enter them. And just as a side note, this uh, series, The Survivors, is not meant to awaken hatred towards such parties. The real purpose of the documentary is to show the people the path, the path of knowledge, which is the only way to make oneself not susceptible to such traps. Because evil has been created by God to kind of give notification. Your shield is down, your guard is down. That's why the dark side has rights on you. We are not some innocent and most importantly helpless victims of psychopath sick rulers which cannot which we cannot overthrow. This is a very dangerous line of thinking which will keep us enslaved. The truth is that although we live in a society, we share a planet, a place, still each one of us lives in a separate reality and the grip of evil will have different rights for each and every person depending on how much ignorance he or she allows in one's personality. The people who wore top hats, the people who built the neoclassical cities during the last couple of centuries, the people who built huge dirigibles and pneumatic trains, they knew a little bit too much to be tolerated by those who were overtaking the world's rulership, they were becoming uncomfortable. The answer to all that was to bury them, their entire culture under mud. Just see how much clay they have to remove, how deep are the railway tracks. Well, the full story of this uh, great flood of mud will come in the future episodes. But since this episode is about technology, I will just um, show a quick example of what happened with what was left from them buried under the mud. It will be about a character called John James Hughes, one of the richest men of his time, an Englishman. So according to the official version, this man in his golden age, although extremely rich, he took his fine English clothes and went 
in the fields of faraway Russia at an uninhabited place to build a metallurgical factory at the wrong place. There was no suitable ore nearby anyway. To make the long story short, I'll skip all the details of how he obtained the lands with frauds and bribe, all those details you can find in this video. And I want to show you the photographs of his alleged construction, because we are told that he arrived and there was nothing, he was the founder. I mean, look at these houses, they are still half buried. All over his alleged new construction place, we see ruins that he is simply excavating. And by the way, it was his personal thing that he was very much fascinated by history. Since he was extremely rich, he used to maintain an entire network of people who would report him from all over the world about any possible interesting acquisitions related to history, including artifacts, old maps, information, or anything else which can be of some value. So probably that is how he knew where to dig. He wasn't building anything new, he was just repairing old stuff. Look at the holes in the roofs of these buildings. Allegedly these photographs were taken around their inauguration time when they were built and just started working. What was there before that we don't know, but the chimneys are really impressive. Compare them to the people's figures besides them. Probably he found those chimneys already there because they were uh, also the houses which were obviously buried under clay. What kind of construction this could be? Half buried rotten pipes and the bricks on the wall are already rotten. So what was he actually doing there? Why are they even digging below this rotten building to repair the pipes, which seem to be beyond repair anyway? Probably not, because they are digging entire level below the pipes. Nobody seems to be working on the rotten wall or the rotten, rotten pipes. Instead of that, we see that there is a simple line organized to transport something to the surface. Yeah, that's what the people are doing, the women, that's what they have in their baskets. It's a uh, light colored stuff, obviously different from the stone around. Is it just white stone? Or is it something shiny, like a shiny metal? We don't know. Or maybe something even more precious? Like these super expensive materials? Looking at the price tags of which, no wonder some people speculate that they can be only meant for export off-planet. So what exactly was being plundered under the pretext of uh, building a factory? We don't know, but we know for sure what is the destiny of those who, like hungry vultures, fed on the corpse of the destroyed culture. John Hughes is now known as founder, as hero. Quite a few monuments are built in his honor. Coins are minted, postcards, etc. So So maybe in conclusion we could say that the technology in the old times was of two types. Type 1 would be devices or subtle structures which are 
far beyond our understanding. They would be used by the gods or angels themselves or would be given as gifts to mortal men by those superior beings. An example of those would be the Brahmastras. That's how a superior type of weapons are called in the Vedic books. They would leave behind nuclear type devastation, which of course doesn't mean that they were exactly nuclear. Another example would be the famous Ark of the Covenant and yet another, the magical Shamir of King Solomon, which could disintegrate any material, including very hard stones, just by its, quote, glance. Judging by the various uh, descriptions of this magical Shamir, it could have been using some sort of technology similar to what now we call alpha radiation. That very King Solomon apparently possessed flying carpets which could transport even thousands of men during a single flight. There was a report that uh, when Rurik went to Tibet over there he heard legends about King Solomon who has been visiting Tibet with his on his flying carpets. And the second group, the second type of advanced ancient technology would be usually very subtle forms of uh, energy transformation which could accomplish amazing things and again it would be taught by the angels to the simple tribal people. And since those higher beings were immensely more knowledgeable than ourselves about the laws of nature and everything else, they could suggest methods which are extremely simple and yet very very effective. Maybe this frost guard could provide some example in this uh, regard. It is relatively simple and doesn't uh, require any digital gadgets. And yet it is uh, much more cost effective and it doesn't pollute the environment as the other means which would be used for the same purpose usually in the modern world. The sound technologies were used really, really a lot in the old times. And it wasn't just about moving objects, which we have also achieved in our laboratories. Blessings and cursing was uh, much more widely used. Those have been also confirmed by modern experiments to be very effective. For example, on YouTube, you can search and easily find many, many experiments uh, take two plants and bless and talk nicely to one of them every day and abuse the other one verbally and then just observe the amazing difference and not just plants people test it with cooked rice juice sprouts it works also things like levitation were used but again, in the modern experiments, it would be almost always some sort of electric device involved. While in the older times, it was the saints who would be seen levitating. But I think it's the technology of the modern holograms which will be the best way to explain ancient technology to the modern man. And we are getting closer and closer to the truth. Now we have interactive holograms, which also can be touched, not just seen. They use plasma technology and we are already making the initial steps of developing a fully tangible physical holograms. So what the celestial guardians of humanity taught to the primitive man was a combination between the use of various holograms, 
physical and not, they were often activated by sound codes or simply brain impulses. These three technologies have been proven to be fully functional and not fantasy by modern experiments. And all that was combined with practical on-hand understanding that everything we experience in our lives, everything we perceive around is one big hologram. For modern men, this is kind of an exotic scientific concept. But since ancient men were already born with bodies geared up for subtle technologies, mainly thought and sound operated, and since they grew up in an environment where since children they were taught how to feel the life pulse of everything around, as a result of all this, they were far better tuned to these all-pervasive patterns of the Creator God, which are responsible for manifesting everything which we perceive as reality. Add-on technologies were also used depending on the field of reality which they wanted to manipulate, for example, levitation, the power of crystals, the powers of the sacred plants. Magic was used on a day-to-day -day basis to accomplish pretty much everything we can imagine and much more. Modern children have their minds clogged up at a very early age with tons of useless or even wrong information, which was not always the case in ancient times when the shamans would teach the really important stuff to the pupils about the nature and subdivisions of reality, which is absolutely holographic and can be adjusted for the purpose of having a happy life using holographic techniques and technologies. Some of these subdivisions are larger, they could be called planes of existence. Others are smaller, these are the clusters like bubbles of the personal realities of the countless living beings like me and you, which reside in these realities. Don't worry that at this point we can air, so to say, only dead, so to say, holographic images. It is just a question of time and holograms will be combined with teleportation, which is also not a science fiction anymore. They have practically managed already to teleport successfully small particles. So, take on one side the technology of the holograms, teleportation and sound, aka magic spells, and combine them with understanding of the nature of karma and the way the various bubbles of personal realities interact between each other. And so you have arrived in the realm of magic practical magic, the technology of ancient people. May the Ascended Masters bless mankind.